Good afternoon, everybody. You're all very, very welcome to St. Luke's Church, Douglas. It's lovely to see you all here this afternoon. He has very much a connection with Douglas and would have indeed worshipped in this space. I'd also like to um, offer my very best wishes to you uh, for this first of uh, the Lennox Robinson Literary Festivals of I Hope Many More to Come. Um, so maybe I will have the pleasure of welcoming you here again in the future. But for now, just to reiterate that you are indeed very, very welcome and to hand you over to Irene. So Billy O'Callaghan will speak first and will be followed by Jim Quealy's reading of some of Lennox Robinson's own work. I'm delighted so many of you have uh, decided to join us here today. I'd like, on behalf of the, uh, the committee of the Lennox Robinson Festival, um, to express uh, our gratitude to Reverend Adrian Wilkinson uh, for making the church available to us uh, here today and for being so supportive of the idea of this uh, reading. I also want to thank uh, Jim Queeley for agreeing to take part. We're really honoured to have an actor of such expertise lend his voice to our cause, which is to help acquaint the current generation with a very fine playwright. Ismay Stewart Lennox Robinson was born in West Grove, Douglas on the 4th of October 1886, the youngest of seven children to Andrew Robinson, a stockbroker, and his wife Emily Nee Jones. He dabbled with writing from quite early on, but through most of his youth, his ambitions tended towards a career in music. But by the year's end, he'd completed his own one-act play, The Clancy Name, a play that, by the way, will be staged uh, by the Manford College of Performing Arts uh, under the direction of Suzanne Jones tomorrow at 3 p.m. in St. Columbus Hall. A year later, Yeats and Lady Gregory made him a stunning offer. The position of manager and producer of the Abbey Theatre had a yearly salary of £150. The tragic death of John Millington Singh at just 37 had left the Abbey rudderless. It seemed absurd that Lennox, at barely 23, could be expected to fill such a gaping void, but Yeats reasoned that the Norwegian theatre in Bergen had taken the same chance on Ibsen at a similar age. I would think that he's probably the only Douglas man ever to win a, an Oscar. I'm not sure if he even knew about it himself. But Several of his plays caused, caused consternation too, cutting perhaps too close to the bone at a time when the political climate was particularly fraught. Mayhem ensued. The Catholic Church accused him of blasphemy and had him dismissed from his position as secretary and treasurer uh, on the board of the Carnegie Trust. Moves were also made to have him removed from the Abbey, but Yeats refused to countenance such suggestions. History records Lennox Robinson as one of the most versatile realists of the Irish literary revival, heavily influenced by Singh, but also the international playwrights, yet marked out as something different due to a rare comedic touch, a deft use of irony, and a constant willingness to experiment with form. One of the aims of this festival, aside from paying long overdue tribute to one of Douglas Village's most notable sons, is to raise awareness of his work. <clears throat> Lennox Robinson was far too good a playwright to be allowed simply slip into obscurity. For the first six years of my own childhood, <clears throat> the towering presence in my life was that of my grandmother. Looking back, she was my great educator instilling in me not only a love of stories, but an awe of them. She was a simple woman, I suppose, um, living a small enough life, but she had a softness about her when it came to culture, and to me she had all the wisdom of the world. The little that the classroom could offer paled by comparison. The dead grey winter mornings that saw us collude in our unspoken way on a sore throat or a belly pain in order to justify me staying at home from school feel as vivid now as if they were part of the week just gone 
instead of half a lifetime ago. And we spent those mornings well, huddled up beside the fire while the wind sang in the chimney. She all skull and bones at 62, but holding court to her enraptured audience. Spinning yarns of the banshee, the fairies, the black and tans, and the Douglas of long ago. It would have been on one such morning that I'd have first heard her mention Lennox Robinson, a real writer, born right here in Douglas, a notion as fantastic to me then as any of her stories. At that age, already reading but limited to a few books, probably Hans Christian Andersen and the Brothers Grimm, writing seemed to me a kind of sorcery, and writers nothing less than myth. That our village, still a small enough place thirty odd years ago, could have produced an actual writer held me spellbound. Years passed before I got around to reading his work, but in my mind and in my heart, Lennox Robinson and my grandmother will always be inextricably linked. But even if there'd been no trace at all of familial blood on the Donnybrook Hill, even if the young Robinson clan had simply blown in and almost straight back out again, it should still be impossible to downplay the fact that Douglas was where Lennox Robinson entered the world. The first breath to fill his mouth tasted of our village, and an October breath at that, such a rich, dense, flavoursome month of the year, with its twilight air so haunted and melancholic, summer spent and the dark of winter lying in wait, a time full of shadows and tumbling leaves, and full, of brimming with stor full to brimming with stories. My grandmother, for one, remembered him very well indeed. And this, of course, is the problem that all history books must face. They live and die by their facts, and can give the essentials of a life, but they invariably lack the blood that gives a story its pulse. I have tried to unfurl the basic facts of Lennox Robinson's life here today, but this is only to tell part of a story. Because facts alone can't begin to tell how it felt to stand at the side of the road as a child. My grandmother was born in, eight, in 1918, waving at the carriage that carried him past on one of his not infrequent visits home. Or to lean with, or to lean with arms folded across the top lat of her roadside cottage's small front gate and watch him stand around in his Dublin finery, waiting outside the forge for the horses to be shod, a tall man cropped to gauntness, already, already by then quite famous, known in almost every corner of the country, slightly drooping and exceedingly shy, possessed, as Lady Gregory put it, of a tendency to gloom, but not too shy to smile a hello, and never too shy to raise a hand and wave back in return. These are the details that encyclopedias and who's who entries miss, the small connections between people and their places, connections that are well worthwhile preserving. Thank you. It is a great privilege to introduce Jim Creeley. Thank you very much. I thought Kilmascully had long been forgotten, but there you are. So, if you are all sitting comfortably, we'll begin. Never in the daytime or in bright sunlight could you see it. But sometimes, just before sunset, when some sinking ray of the sun was reflected from the rock to the lake's dark surface, and always in moonlight and on clear starry nights. Then, lying flat on the top of the cliff and peering over, you could see the face quite clearly. He had known it all his life. He could not have been more than six years old when his father had led him to the cliff's edge and shown him the sleeping face in the water. He had never been afraid of it, as were some of the other boys. On the contrary, when he was sent to drive the sheep from one hill to another, he would contrive to pass the lake 
either coming or going. He would loiter there until the sun sank and risk a scolding when he got home. But hardly a week would pass without his seeing the face. Fifteen years after his father's death, his mother died, and when the funeral was over, he climbed the mountain and stared for a long time into the water. It was a stormy winter evening, and as the sun went down, a pale young moon appeared. Never had the face been so clear. Never had it looked more lovely. He had nothing left in the world to love except this face. It had no rival now. He could pour out all the love of his heart in adoration of it. He spent now whole nights on the cliff. Sometimes he thought he saw a stirring of the eyelids, and the fancy grew in him that after sufficient concentration of devotion on his part, the eyes would open. Until one evening, gazing down at those closed eyes, he saw the lids stir and stir again, and at last, very slowly, they opened. The eyes behind them were dazzlingly blue, and they met his gray ones with a long, comprehending look. Everything he had ever hoped to see in a woman's eyes was there, and half in terror, half in joy, he gave a cry and drew back from the cliff. When he looked again, a second later, the face had vanished. It was three days later at the fair of Coolmoor that he found her. She was standing with her back to the wall outside the post office, and a little curious crowd was around her, questioning her and uh, touching her clothes. There was a strangeness, a, a fondness about her. And when the village policeman came and began to question her, the crowd gathered closer, but her replies were incoherent. Then she lifted her eyes, and beyond the fringe of the crowd, they met Jerry's eyes. He again saw that look. He strode to her, pushing the crowd away, roughly right and left, he put his arm into hers and led her to his house. The priest married them, and they lived in perfect contentment and happiness. She had been pale and fragile when he brought her home, but she grew every day stronger and more beautiful. She knew nothing of housework or farm work and learned but little, preferring to sit in the shadow of a rock in the field while Jerry worked and in the winter to crouch in the corner near the fire or sit in the window in the moonlight. In the second November of their marriage, when the moon was full, a child was born to them a child as fragile as a moon ray that lay in the cradle, hardly stirring, never crying. The fair of Coolmore was held ten days later, and Jerry had to bring some cattle to it to sell. He sold his cattle, but there was a delay about payment and it was after four o'clock when he left Coolmore village. And as he reached the top of the pass, it began to snow. 
It was early in the year for snow, but this was a heavy shower, and the big flakes half blinded him as he pushed doggedly on. But his boots grew clogged. He had to walk more and more slowly, and when he was three miles from home, he determined to take a short cut across the hills, which would shorten his road by a half a mile. It was wild walking, but he knew every foot of the path. It led him along the top of the cliff above the lake. Something, old habit perhaps, made him fall on his knees and peer over And there in the pool below, he saw the face. It was there, just as it had always been, with closed eyes and floating hair. He rose to his feet, vaguely troubled. He had never seen it since his marriage. Half a mile from the house, He met Peg McCarthy walking quickly towards him. Oh, thank God. Thank God it's yourself, Jerry, she said. The wife, God help me, is gone. I saw her just before milking time and she was sitting by the fire. I said, you had a bad walk home and she said she wished she could go and meet you. Then afterwards I was sitting at my tea and a step passed on the road. And now when I went to your house, she's gone. Hardly stopping to answer her, he ran home. It was true. She was not there. The child lay quietly sleeping in its cradle. Then he thought of the face in the lake. And he ran up the road and along the path and over the breast of the hill, to the cliff's edge. The face was there still, and again, as he had done years before, he climbed down to the rock. He still saw the face. He touched the water. The face did not vanish. He plunged in his arms and drew his wife's body to the shore. In the water, The face had appeared living. Out of it, with the wet hair clinging about it, it was cold and dead. Had she come to meet him and fallen in? He could see no hurt on her. Or had she fled from him back to the element to which she belonged? The wet form in his arms seemed less his than the woman in the water. Every impulse of his nature urged him to lay her back. He did so, and she sank in the deep pool till only her face was seen. He climbed the cliff and walked home. He felt strangely bewildered. He hardly grieved. Had he lost her? Or had he ever had her? Was this only the evening of his mother's funeral? And had he, kneeling on that cliff, fallen into a dream and dreamed of the faces awakening, of the marriage, of the child. No, no, this last was real at any rate. And he took it from the cradle and held it in his arms and stood by the window looking out at the dying moon. And yet, Was it only fancy, or as the sickly moon sank, did the child really grow lighter 
and light her in his arms? And would he find when morning broke that he was only clasping a tangle of wet lake weed wrapped in an old quilt? 